tough one, this, because you put so much of yourself out there. I know. That, uh, where, does, where does an interviewer begin? If you do expose something and make me uncomfortable, I'm sure as hell be turning it into a touring show <laughs> next year. So you can't win today. Because, I mean, <laughs> I mean this is no exaggeration. For, for people who, who, who don't, aren't completely familiar with your work, uh, traumatic divorces, short marriages, personal crises... Um, sliding down the fridge yeah. in a state of emotional collapse. It's all there. I don't, I don't have any really juicy ones, which I constantly... No. I'm, I'm like, do I, shall I purposely take heroin for a year? I don't have any really juicy addictions. Uh, I this, this will go out after yeah. my interview with Irving Welsh, who spent a significant part of talking about his addiction well, to heroin for a my, year. My, it's almost like we plan it. <laughs> in my world, as long as you're recovered from it, yes. it's great. Um, so, undivorced parents, I wasn't abused... Uh, I wasn't even... I, I was upper working class. All I've got is I've got flat feet, i.e. probably you've got Erlers Danlos type 1, and I come... I'm slightly chavvy. I mean, that's, that is minority. And the Essex thing, that is a stereotype I sort of play with. You, did, you, did, you didn't get on well with your dad growing up, though. I mean, is that not...? We were just different, I right. think. I, because sometimes when I phrase it like that, people see two, like, warring people. I did. Um, but I think sometimes... As you'll know, if you go to a dinner party and you get sat next to someone who you've just got nothing in common with, that, he's not a bad person. It's just enough for the... Like, your shoulders are rubbing, yeah, like you're yeah. knocking each other's yeah. cutlery. And we were just opposite people. Um, I'm like a carbon copy of my mum. My mum looks like me with a, a perm on. My my dad was <laughs> six foot tall, uh, steroid-taking, weightlifter, doorman, uh, lifeguard, model at one stage, uh, BNP voting, very right wing, metal welding, lump of Essex steak. Seriously. And I'm a sort of literature loving, skipping, glittery question mark, is my son gay type boy. So we were just on different planets. When did know? that become clear? Can you remember? When did it? When did it... What, the opposites? Yeah, when did you? Because most, I mean, great, some, your dad's your hero for. for... I, I look at pictures where when I'm sort of new, like a baby, and see my dad cradling me, like one of those, you know, the male gorillas yeah. who just has a moment of <laughs> tenderness with this, the moonlight glinting off their silver fur at the back. And I find it... Oh, it's going to sound... You've gone deep already, James. That's what I'm here you, for. You, you, I find it hard to identify with that image. I've got Still. no memories of the, ba- of the baby dad image. My, I, my dad, from the, as young as I can remember, was like, I was working when I was your age. He's obviously li- a lying and exaggerating. You're like five at this point. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was working, but I was working in utero when I was inside your nan. <laughs> You know what I mean? That's your man. Um, um, not a happy man, then. Uh, it, it, it was just... It was all about life's a struggle. Do you know what I mean? People will let you down, boy. Law, law of least effort. People will crush your dreams. People always waiting to shit on you. And it, everything was a, was difficult and a struggle. And But was when I hit 11, 12, and the puberty yeah. emotions kicked in, yeah. and my rebellion was to... Read books, or sensitive, or then to smoke wacky backy what Jamaican smoke. I mean, then it really did kick off. So my dad was like straight edge bodybuilder. Yeah, still going down to the gym three times a week. He popped his clogs at a young age from a birth defect that was undetected. Oh lord! The man went on a birth defect to age sixty three. I mean, that's what you call <laughs> the will to live. Do you, I, it's interesting because already I'm thinking you are determined to see the positive. And yet, what you described was actually pretty negative. So yeah. the analogy of sitting next to someone at a dinner party who you don't like, it doesn't bear that much resemblance to what you just described. No, it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't a positive experience no. at all. It was a funny experience. Well, and I think when people laugh, that's a positive emotion. So I could produce positive emotions, but I, I for the first five tours, felt like a fraud. I didn't write a word of stand-up. I quoted verbatim and told the story like you would tell a mate down the pub without any art of it. I, this is my natural way of speaking. Yes, I, don't, I, I don't really change it when I'm on stage. So uh, people are like, it's, yeah, well, you're a genius. I'm like, it's got nothing to do with me. My dad's the one that, well, we, when I was 18, he, now and again he had these what I call four stellar artois moments where a softness came over him and the wobble head. He went, come here, boy, I've got something I want to tell you. Like The other man just would show himself just for a second. Yeah. He went, you know, I never tell you, but... You know what I mean? And I like, he's getting so close to saying, I love you. And then he went, I just want you to admit, and this is what he said, I never hit you, have I? I've never laid a finger on you. Like that to him was the greatest achievement. Sure. I never hit my son. And I was already like trying not to laugh. Yeah. And then he went, Do you know why? And I thought, he's going to say it now. And he went, Because if I started, I wouldn't fucking oh stop. No. Do you know what I mean? The size of me, boy, I couldn't trust myself to continue. And that was the end of that tender moment. <laughs> and, my life, and my childhood is full of these unintentional bits of, of comedy. And were you seeing them from the outside even then? Were you seeing them as... No, as... no, I don't think... No, because when I first started stand-up, 
I was doing the cla- like the first couple of years when I was doing amateur spots, and I got this bit of a coup called it's called Edinburgh and Beyond, where they put four comedians together who are all up, one who's very new and one who's up and coming, who was Russell Howard, and they put you all out on the road together. And in the car, on the way to the gigs, I was telling them this stuff about my dad. Right. And Russell Howard was going, why, are you mad? I've just watched you do five minutes about masturbation yeah. and you're making us cry laughing in the car. And I'm like, right. I can't talk this stuff on stage. Who's interested in my dad? And then I realised, shit, it's I'm sitting. I, I went like that, and there's a gold mine. I, I mean, I, I was sort of, you clear the dirt away, and you're like, I, I'm rich, material-wise. I'm rich. That's it, it's still going. I'm still I'm going back in this year. I'm developing The Fast and the Curious at the moment, and two of the biggest stories in there are about my old man again. When did you lose him? 2003. So my dad died before I even started stand-up. What I think doing? sort of spitefully. Jeez. I'm going to pass <laughs> away. <laughs> to see I don't want to see you achieve anything. <laughs> oh, well, alternatively, he might have been um, mortified to see the... Yeah, well, he couldn't take a joke. So my mum loves it. She, <laughs> thinks, she, she thinks it, <laughs> finds it hilarious. But he was a, he was an older dad. He was a lot older than my mum. My dad right. was the same age as my nan, in fact. So, so that's okay. the same age yeah. as my mum's mum. Um, but, yeah, he's... he's I can p- point to anything in this room and I know what there's a laptop there, I, I, there, there's a phone there, and I know what my dad would think about it waste of waste of money, rip off. When I got a mobile phone, he, I had about a five minute speech about that. Yeah. Waste of money. Why do you need to be on the phone when you're on the move? So, what were you, as you grew up in this house with this astonishing contradiction between your two parents yeah. and your, your eggs, as it were, pretty much all in your mum's basket? Yeah. Um, were you walking on eggshells? Were you frightened of, of, of setting him off? Or were you... Uh, so, like like I said, and like my dad said, I never laid a finger on you. I right. only saw him shout a few times. Okay. It's like those teachers that don't need to raise their voice. Yeah. He just didn't need to. I never answered my dad back once in my entire life, in his entire life. And I never saw anyone ever answer him back, apart from my nan, my mum's mum, who right. I eventually moved in with when I was 19, when I couldn't take it anymore, no. who was an alcoholic. And some of the... Some, I'm allowed to swear on yeah, this, of course I, can. I can't talk about my nan without swearing. She got into the car... Smoke, my dad's like a straight-edge bodybuilder. Yeah. So my, she's got into the car smoking in my dad's murk, and uh, she's blowing smoke in the front of the car, and he went, put the cigarette out, Joyce, when you're in the murk. And she leant forward and went, fuck off. And I swear to God, it's one of the few times in my life I've seen hairs in each internment. Ding, 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 ding. Because my nan was like, you know the Pepper Army character? Yeah. That's what my nan was like, just a Pepper Army with hair on. <laughs> I thought he was going to kill her. I thought he was going to kill her. It's the only person. And something I should put it in this year's show, actually. Scott, my best mate, was telling me that they used to take it in turns. to. We used to go knock for each other when we were 15, 16 yeah. and go over the park. They used to take it in turns to knock at my house because no one wanted to risk it would be my old man that would come to the door. A man that never shouted, never raised his voice. So he just had an air of menace. Yeah. He just had a constant he air a of big, menace. He was obviously a big bloke. He must sure. have been 16, 17 stone, 5 per cent body fat. Yeah. And it was just, uh, he'd come so you, to the door. We've done 25 of these. You're the 26th, unfiltered. And what, one thing that's happened quite weirdly um, is themes have emerged unexpectedly, like connections between the guests. And, and what you've described is very similar, actually, to Robert Webb's childhood yes and and yet you have uh, gone down very different paths subsequently but that very domineering potentially uh violent father but not not no, violent emotional and violence is a form of violence that gets overlooked sometimes i think you're right. unintentional and you having both having this 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 very artistic side but trying to nurture it in an environment where it was considered to be a negative rather than a positive so Robert and I have that in common, particularly growing up in like this hetero white. I mean, I yeah. am straight, but you know what I mean. Hetero, that sort of overly hetero white culture of if you get caught reading a book, it, you might as well get caught in exactly. a dress. Yeah. So you were in Essex. He was in rural Lincolnshire. The difference was, if I'm remembering my Robert Webb biography correctly, is yeah. his mum was a teacher or something. Yeah, there was an so intellectual. So he, he had that working class but literature in the house type right. glint, whereas I. I've had to do it with nothing. Not that my my mum just didn't know about this world. Yeah. I remember asking my mum what came after A levels once. She didn't know. It, so there was no books in the house. There was nothing. So I was not just one bootstrap. I was yeah. double bootstrapped. I was the first person in my family to get an A level, and then the first person to get a degree. Let's go back before that then. So primary school, and and this would be new territory for you then. You wouldn't. You wouldn't. You didn't arrive. You arrived in education without any. Points of reference. 
primary school, I was top of the class all were the you? way through. So you knew you were clever from a very early age. From, from nursery, which is the age my, my, I've got a two-year-old daughter now, she's apparently exactly like me. So my mum said, first day of nursery, all the babies are clinging yeah. to the mum's legs, and I was, I was like, bye, phew, gone. <laughs> Could not wait. Bored, bored, shitless. Clearly. I've been bored my whole life. This is the first time, the last ten years of my life, where people have actually spun my hamster wheel fast yeah. enough to tie me out. Before that, I'm like, I'm like that. Even when I was in advertising, really. We're I mean, jumping forward again. I was, I was still in primary school. Sorry, you've already I'm, started your career. I mean no, I understand. When I, I, when I was, I, my cassette, my daughter, bored. She's bored the whole time. Bored, bored. Next, next. What's next? Not, not eight. They don't need to give it a label. It wasn't yeah. ADHD because I had no problem with my concentration. Right. So if you had to sit down and do a two-hour shift, you could. Yeah. Because a lot I, of people watching now are going to be thinking exactly what you no, just I said. No, I love being tasked up. I love learning a language. I love, love right. plowing through a long novel slowly. Um, but. It, I wasn't getting that intellectual weightlifting I needed at Sustenance. home. So from nursery, I was absolutely ping top of the class, and it lasted till I was eleven. Well, well, well then, let's then, not jump yeah. the gun. But the I'll tell you who you, what I'm thinking of rather oddly. Do you remember that film Short Circuit? Yeah, number five is alive. Yeah. You need more input. All yeah, the was time. it? More input. That's more input. Like. More input. That's what it's like. And, and I always thought by the time I got to this age, it would slow down. But I swear to. God, even though I'm an atheist, I swear to Dawkins, <laughs> in, it has got worse in the last two years. Has it really? I think it's going to end some sort of zero event sort of thing where my mind folds in on itself. Well, also, you're very politically engaged, and, and politics has been nuts. So if Maybe. you, and if, if, you, if we were to over analyze it now and see it as some Maybe. sort of quest for understanding, the stuff that's happened in the last two years has made understanding feel more out of reach Absolutely. than ever before, and that might be what's Maybe. set your wheels spinning. But so, the primary school got the yeah. raw, I think, this is why I've got such a problem with our education go system. On. And this is why I've got... We go about education all wrong. Whenever we do something in this country, and we go, we're going to change it up, we're going to change sex education, we're going to change racial education, yeah. we go to secondary school. Why are you bothering with 11-year-olds? I feel sad for them, yeah. but it's game over. Pretty much. Fucked, done. You yeah. won't find a study on the planet. All the ingredients that decide what the acorn will grow into pretty much goes in between 3 and 11. I know it's heartbreaking. Mm. I know you want to think your dad walking out on you when you were 13 is what did it. But most of what we've got was done that, that forms us, that you've got to fight back from or, or grow into, is between 0 and 11. That's when sex education should be. That's when X, Y, Z should be. It's when racial education... All of that stuff should be happening at primary school, but we'll never do it because we've got this leftover of the innocent yeah, blank slate. Yeah. I mean, they, tried, they did an experiment on Channel 4 recently where they took sex education into secondary school and all the parents complained. I just, I'm using sex education because it's the perfect example of how we misunderstand how kids' well, brains Well, you probably shouldn't even call it that. That's part of the problem as well, because it makes grown-ups, especially repressed grown-ups... Which is England. Which is mostly... United Kingdom. Yeah, which makes them all cross their legs and go peak Victorian, doesn't but you, it? But you can almost draw a graph and plot the age of sex education yeah. with the rate of teenage pregnancy. It almost tracks... In a line. And guess who's right at the top We're there? not anymore. No, we're about, the, quite near the top. We're quite, but we've had a good te decade. It's, it's, yeah. it's halved in ten years. It's moving in the right direction. But you're right, the because reluctance... In Scotland, it, they can now teach in primary school. Um, whereas most of the schools in England... Still. Still can't, because of the likes of... I'm not having a go at Melanie Phillips. I think she's a clever lady. Still going on question time and saying things like, why would you put thoughts of sex into a yes. six-year-old's head yes. when the thoughts of sex aren't there to start with? Do you know what? What ridiculous I, logic. They're not thinking about the Tudors either. No. So let's not teach them about Henry VIII or anything. And, and also, of course, if, if what I use on, on the radio show with the religious fundamentalists is um, if, if something that isn't supposed to be happening is happening to a child and they've been told at home that it is supposed to be happening and it's normal, mm. how, how are they ever going to know that it's not normal no. unless someone at school is talking to them about it? This is where the NSPCC stuff is, mm -hmm. is so powerful. This is going to be an interesting interview, isn't it? Because <laughs> I'm going to have to try and remember where we are. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, no, it's fine. What happened at 11? Why did it all suddenly my, go? Because you were a teacher's pet. My point, my point is, between 5 and 11, the, my natural, raw, animal curiosity, yes. I was able to be... Was harnessed and fed. Because, I, because it was fine. The second you got to... It, uh, I was 11. Yeah. I went to the local comprehensive. Now, if you live in a poor area and you go to a comprehensive, you better hope you're not brainy. Right. You better hope to God you're not brainy because you will get the living shit kicked out of you. Or if you're clever like me, you'll learn to be funny, yeah. go into the middle sets and survive and come out with, if you're lucky, a couple an A, a B, a few Cs. And if I'd, if I'd spoken to you then and said, are you... Are you Keeping your light under a bushel, you're pretending to be less clever than you are. Would, you, would you have had the self-awareness to say yes? 
I think I would have told told you I don't find that shit interesting anymore. I want to be the cool kid. That's yeah. what I want to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At my school, it was who's tried weed, who's lost yeah. their virginity, who can beat who up. They're the boys that got the female attention. They're the boys that were popular at my school. That's just the way it rolls. Really uncomfortable for lefties like me who think grammar schools are evil. But the, the reality is, if I'd have been skimmed off at 11 yes. and put with other bright chavs, I would have absolutely smashed it and done a web and gone to Oxford and Cambridge and all that. Um, but I wasn't. Way. I was put into this pot of mixed ability boys. And in that pot, for a temporary five years, yeah. I honestly believe, particularly boys, value system inverts. Right. It, re- it reverts again yeah. when they're 21. Of course, you should have passed my exams. Yeah. But unfortunately, between 11 and 18, your value system spins on its head if you're from an ultra working class, right. council estate background. And I wanted, I've always wanted to be popular. I'm a stand-up for Christ's sure. sake. So I did, what, I did what I had to do, which, Can, w- which was I, I associated more with the, the tough crowd and I, su- I survived. I was never accepted by them because I'm too nerdy, but I wasn't bullied. I pulled through. And, and well, then, how did you work out what you needed to do then if you weren't bullied? Because uh, another previous guest, John Ronson, talks about being really bullied and for very similar reasons to you, albeit he was at a Welsh comprehensive school. But he comps tells, don't work. They don't work. And I know it's controversial to say it. Comprehensives don't work for people like me, but, but they work for more people than they don't work for, so yes. I have to keep my mouth shut. And that's why you support grammar schools while s- simultaneously knowing that you don't. There's yeah. a cognitive dissonance but, there, but, because this system would work for me, but I appreciate in a utilitarian sense. We live sense. in a private school system. We live in a private school system where the value of your house is pegged to the quality of your education. Yes. Anyone who doesn't believe that is kidding himself. If I spend a £2 million house, I'll get a £2 million education at the local comprehensive. It, yes. Fact. Sorry if it's uncomfortable. It's not, I don't think it is uncomfortable. Back, back to the bullying that yeah. didn't happen to you because yep. it did happen to John and he talks about it in a very similar way to you do and almost like the curse of cleverness although he had a I don't know whether I'd say he had more confidence or, or perhaps he had less desire to be liked than yeah. you just described so he got on, he ploughed his own furrow but he tells a story about being stripped naked and thrown into the playground at about the age you're talking about how did you work out that you needed to have these survival mechanisms if you never really felt the full force of the bullies or the well, nasty I know John's work very well I mean, yes. I've been to see him live and read all every single word he's ever written so I'm very familiar with John and we're very different people yes I won't ju- we're, all, we're not born equal. Back to the grammar school education question again. Wish we were. And I've always been funny. Like my daughter's like it now. I've always done voices. I've always done impressions. I've always been able to worm my way into people's affections by cracking jokes. Yeah. So I just need. I just used that. I've never been shy, uh, and I was able. And what were you frightened of, Russell? Well, at my school, for example, if it was your birthday, you did Tunnel of Death, which is where all of the kids, all of the boys in the top bracket would line a tunnel on the wall and you'd run for it and get kicked in and my birthday was in august so right. i used to live in absolute fear that i'd get like the in september people would remember <laughs> so your old one i mean i was pu- i was punched and punched right. on the arm and and give thrown over benches and but only once in a blue moon right so the fear was that you become the regular that would become target. regular so i if can i can you remember the kids who were regularly yes, brutalized i i would say i was in the league just above the league of boys, you know, the ones that smelt of wee or yeah. looked at the ceiling or got beaten up or yes. don't, were into Dungeons and Dragons, which I loved and yeah. had to hold off till I was Never 16 to anyone, play. Uh, that like chess and, yeah. that, and that were, well, I am brainy, I don't care. They took the, they just, their right. arms were just blue the whole time. It's always on the arms that it could be yeah, hidden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, a funny thing, that. And it hasn't changed, has it? In, in many ways, we seem to be moving backwards, that, this, this the, the refusal to venerate intelligence. It's so bizarre. But it's going so to a, you go into... You see it time and time again, the working-class boy who goes to the grammar school makes it to Oxbridge, so there's obviously mm. something there. And then we have to listen to all these politicians going, well, I went to a yes. comprehensive... And I'm, Do you know what a pathetic 0.001 exception you are? Mm. You're not helping the debate. Mm. How can we make education work for everyone? My mum and dad... Both secondary moderns, mm. right? So mm. I'm not back in that system. Sure. They had shit educations and they hated school and they were dumped in a bin aged 11. Not acceptable. But I basically switched off from 11 to 18, but I came back hard at 18. But I might as well have just stayed home and read books. So GCSEs were a bit of a no. I still got an A in English. Yeah. But, um, I left with five GCSEs. Right. It's criminal, really. And you did your A levels somewhere else? I did my A levels at the local college where. 
which was just an excuse to not have to go to work. But, that but an A in, in English GCSE against the backdrop that you've just yeah, described yeah. is worth... It's like uh, books. But that's, that's worth... I got an A, but I was at one of the most expensive schools in the country. So yeah. for me, your A is worth ten times. Well, <laughs> Maybe. Mine, well, genuinely it is, yeah. because, you know... Mine's it, an R. But, <laughs> <laughs> exactly that. But so you knew. This is what I find fascinating, and you still do. This is the, the, the tension, really, right inside you, is between between who you are and where you are almost. So you knew you were really clever. At this point, I still didn't have insight into my condition. OK. So as a psychologist would phrase it, I thought, I'm winning. I have dropped out on purpose on the system. I want to be one. I'm quite happy being the funny guy. Books, I'm not yeah. a gay lord. I'm okay. going to go and get a job and get my money in the world. But first, if I don't have to work till 18, I'll go to the local weed yeah. MDMA uh, acid college around the corner, which is all you did. You just got high there and do... A levels, yeah. which I didn't do, attend hardly. I attended the minimum lessons right. to, to not, not get, get chucked, chucked out. out. So I basically, left with nothing. I got one D or something, and then it was into the real world. And what happened then? Um, so, and this is I can't. I'm writing a book at the moment. I can't. Yeah. I've never really written this. I call it like a reverse nervous breakdown, Go like on. a nervous build up. So I left. And I, I've always had a gift of the gab. So I said, my mum, I went on the dole for a few months, and my mum's like, it's not happening, you need to get a job. I'm like, right, I've still, it's awful, I don't condone drug use, but I could, sure. I've still got diaries where I'm in the back, I need £10 for petrol, uh, five for some weed, Rizzlers, I knew exactly how much I needed to get through the week. And so that's it, I've got a job selling watches, and I've retained a passion for watches Have my you? whole life. I'm wearing a very understated Oris nice. yeah. today. <laughs> and uh, I've got a job set in the watches of Switzerland, quickly worked my way up. I was in the Rolex showroom selling Rolexes, which I still adore to this day. Why uh, do you like to... I, I remember this. I won't let you lose your thread. But what is the... I've never got this thing with watches, because I'm going to sound like a crap what? comedian when I say they all tell the same time. What's the, <laughs> what's the appeal? Well, I've ne I don't have a single manly thing about me. I hate sport. I don't yeah. know anything about cars. Sure. I'm rubbish at weightlifting. But... <laughs> no, sure. No, but... but well, but watches, because I sold them and learned so much about them right. and got passionate about selling them, I accidentally was radicalised. Got you. Yes. Uh, and I, for, for a Rolex, for example, it's 18 months from when that uh, Oyster case is made to when it leaves the factory. It's got more parts than a Ferrari, I believe. I believe that to be true. Um, they're just fascinating machines. They're beautiful works But this is more art. input again, then. This is you just not realising how much information there is it's attached a horror, to a watch. And horological absorption. You're, you're sucking it in. Anyway, so... There, there you were, there, flogging there, Rolex. There I was, selling Rolex. I, mean, you know, I was a shop, a shop, a glorified shop boy, but yeah. a good one. Yeah. And I felt, I wouldn't have recognised it as Marxism at the time, right. a growing resentment, particularly if the customers were English, posh mum and dad, posh kid, graduation present, choosing a nice wash. I was like, there's them, and then there's my lot. Lovely. I, I started to dawn on me which path I'd taken... This is when it, the, the, the starts to wake up. Then um, I, everything was about the Saturday, going out clubbing on the Saturday, yeah. raving, illegal, legal, strawberry Sundays in Vauxhall. If you were, if you were there, yeah. you were there. It went off like a left open fridge every weekend. <laughs> and there I was, uh, had a few sherries, shall we say. Of course. Looking at, looking at my skull. This beautiful girl comes across the dance floor about an inch taller than me, model. Just hands me her number like that, me and nobody, yeah. 19 years old. I phone her, we start dating. She comes from the them team. Right. Not overly posh, but posh. She's doing her first semester at university. So a lot of the time I was waking up to go to work in halls. Something yeah. I'd never thought... I know the university was something went to, you went to, but right. my only contact with the university was watching the young ones. Yeah. And that's what I thought students were. And, of course, I'm waking up in halls, looking out the window before I go and get my annoying 7.30am train or getting in at 6.30pm and seeing people sat on the lawn yeah. when I got back from work, books, ideas. What time are you up tomorrow, Quentin? Oh, I'm up at 10.30. I've only got two lectures this week. And I'm like, <laughs> I have been <laughs> robbed by my birth. Bloody hell. I have popped out of Julie Kane. And it has been decided at that moment that I would work in a shop just like my grandma worked in a shop, just like my mum's a cleaner, just like everyone in my family has done this, that and the other. And I thought, no fucking way. Not with the software that I'm not using. Fuck off. So I waited till I was 21 because the bar drops for unis as soon as you're a mature student. Right. So I knew I, you need one A-level yeah. as long as you can ace the interviews. So you were doing research now. You were looking into it. I you were was finding like, out. It was, so hang on, I've got so I've got two things. I've got the people coming into the shop, 
I worked in a shop. That was the start of it. No, though. but I, did, yeah, I worked at a shop at the same time, and they used to talk French because they'd think I wouldn't be able to understand. They'd be, <laughs> buy, they'd be buying the graduation suit for their son. It was when I was trying to break into journalism, and I was stuck in menswear. <laughs> and I know the people you're talking about, so you'd feel resentment towards them. But then when you started dating this girl and Burgundy. seeing the world that she lived in, there wasn't resentment there. There it, was aspiration. No, I think there was. Uh, no, I think there was aspiration mixed with an anger. As right. Well. A short, like a short. It's a. Qu- if I had to draw an analogous example based on what's happening today with the Me Too stuff, it's yes. like, oh, my God, I was assaulted. I right, didn't realise. Yeah, okay. I was sociologically God, assaulted and I had no clue. There you are, council estate. You're going to do that for the rest of your life. Comprehensive, into the system, into the sausage factory. And I've got it in my diary. I was smoking a cigarette. I was on a fag break down in the smoking room. So I'd woken up at Zoe's that morning yeah. and I stubbed the cigarette out and I wrote in my diary, today's the day. It changes. Shut up. I went home that night. This is just before the internet. This is yeah. this would be 96, 97. It's just, internet was just started. And I found out you could send, do A... Obviously, I had to work full time. Yeah. I found out you could do A-levels by postal correspondence. I was living at my nan's at this point. Yeah. That's another story. In a, in a housing association flat in a box room, no wardrobe. Stoned every night on Sherry. And uh, I sent off for A-level sociology because I thought, this is what's pissed me off here. It's not a subject I know anything about. It arrives in these three boxes, which I'm supposed to study over two years. Mm. Three months later, I was sat as an external student in my local college, which means you're on, literally on a slightly separate table. Yeah, I remember. And the invigilator inspects you. I got the fastest ever A grade from enrolment to graduation in sociology for the last five years. I won an award, which was given to me by Betty Boothroyd. My mum still got the... She was a speaker of the House of Commons at the time. And with that A level, basically I could pick... I had my pick of the unis I'd applied to. But I chose to go to the one that I thought would keep this energy going, this enthusiasm. Right. Okay. So I could have gone and done anthropology somewhere posh, but I was like, I'm not really, I don't, I don't really care what the mountain Arapesh tribe do. I do care about English yeah. and journalism, which I wanted to go into at the time, and writing. Now, at the time, there was only one undergraduate degree that had a vocational, because I'm working class, so I was obsessed, yeah. it must have a vocational yeah. punchline. So that's why I went to Middlesex. It was down the road from my nan, um, and I Not know Foster's, people, it, might, has... people might turn their nose up at Middlesex, but I knew it was the course for me, and I was right. I was the only person to get a first on my year. We, we just fast forwarded three know, years. You've but done it. it went like that for the whole what three years. What did your mum think about this? About this plan? They, all, they all thought it was great because there was no risk involved. No, but, but oh, okay. So they would stone. just see it as something instead of staying in the watch shop or doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, by this point, my mum. Remember, my mum was more or less a kid when she had me. So by this age, she knows about university and okay. stuff and bettering yourself, and is yeah. totally behind me. So I went there, and. Where I'd had three years to prepare, I'd saved up enough money in my bank account so I could draw out £80 a week, every week from the cash machine, and I wouldn't need to work in the summer holidays. Right. That was my secret weapon. So I pre-read all the reading list before semester started. So I was still able to attend every a party. I, was able, I, didn't, I never missed a pound of pint night. I never missed a party. But first, 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 I just aced it because I was, I was angry. It was, resen- it was aspiration, just, but it was like... I didn't know this about it. It was like... Pff, pff, Fuck you, fuck you, Chaucer. At every turn. And, Do you and not think that maybe your dad felt the same way and just reacted to it in a completely different way? Your he dad went felt down. mugged. He, he, de- he did the, what's the point, into yeah, the seat. exactly. Whereas I did the, eh, martial arts. Because if you hadn't watched your dad, maybe you wouldn't maybe have had not. it within you to be cross. Maybe not. I mean, I did some weird shit during those three years. So Because I was behind all the private school kids, so they would turn up... And people don't realise how much you can go through education having missed everything. Yeah, no. I mean, no. it's embarrassing to admit this on camera, given that I'm doing things like Good Read and hosting Open Book yes. and stuff now. People talk about Jane Austen, and I'm like, didn't know what they're talking about. Yeah. I don't know who she was. I'd read kids' books and then gone to my education stopped at 11. Yeah. So I literally went from A to Z, like the autodidact in that, in that such I think Sartre wrote a yeah. novel called Nausea with this idiot character called the autodidact. I went from Austin through to Zola, and I kept going back, just one novel on the go, sure. and just reading the biographies until I caught up and then overtook. And were you getting nourished by them? You're Total. not just doing it like cramming the night before an exam. You're, you're, you're doing... No, the, these weren't studied no- novelists. I was, I was doing my work. No, I know, but you're not doing it just because you felt, I want to be a person that's read 100 books. Yes. No, I was doing it because I want to feel I've been a person that's read 100 books. And not only was I doing that, and this is the worst one. Go on. Every time I encountered a word I didn't know, which, yeah. when would I? I come from yeah. a council estate, my education stopped at 11. I wrote it on a card, and I carried that card with me until it was in, in me and not 
been artificially but why, brought why, up. Why, why do you describe that in such a negative way? Because it's embarrassing to be like a. I won't. I won't. I won't name another comedian, but you know when you feel some comedians are using long words for display rather than for their intrinsic meaning? Does it discombobulate you? <laughs> and someone who learnt words after the age of 21, yeah. there's always that, but you, that's not real, they're not your real words. Like, they weren't my words. They were the words of those other people. The words, are, words are the weapons that you have to break they out. They wound sometimes. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Accidents of birth, aren't so they? So the first card, I'll never forget, it was impudent. Yeah. From Pride and Prejudice, and yeah. I had the word impudent. And because of where I come from, and because I didn't want my friends at uni to know, I had no one, there's no internet yet, I had to learn the phonetic alphabet. That could be impudent. It could be impudent. I didn't know. Yeah. So I had to write down with... Li- I learned all the phonetic symbols. And then I also had the cognates, impudence, impudently, yes. impudence, so I wouldn't fuck those up, and the meaning. And I would have them on the toilet, and I'd write... T- and once I was like, I know that one now, I'd get rid of the card. I must have got... And I, it was a, ha- a habit I found hard to shake for several years. Why would you want to shake it? Because Maybe not that level some, of There's studying. something... And I'm not using this word to be offensive. No, there's something autistic about... Learning the word impudent and then going in and having a oh, conversation. Oh, I see what you mean. So it becomes like almost obsessive, collecting, uh, now, rather, rather than an yes. end, rather than a means to an end. It becomes an end in itself. And I, yeah. and I knew it was organic when I was using a word, and I was like, "Was that one of the ones from my cards?" Or I don't know. Anyway, the person was being really impudent yesterday. Now it's it seems so absurd. And in fact, I burnt them. I was so ashamed. I Did burnt them really? when I got to thirty. I burnt I burnt all of them, which I could kick myself because I could give them to my daughter now. Of course. But I was so she's going to be reading books from a very early age, so she's not going to end up with the gaps that you. It, but it was like I'd done a cognitive raid on on the palace. Yeah. I'd gone and I took them all, and I went to the extra plays and I went, things that weren't on my course. Once once my course changed to the creative thing in the last yeah. year, I was I went of course because the. That's what I've been training for my whole life. So it worked. You left Middlesex and you went into the kind of job that you never could have got yeah. without having gone to Middlesex. That's, and I was so glad I did that rather than anthropology at Goldsmiths or whatever it was I got into because I finished in the May. Got the that's still There's two of my proudest achievements, that yeah. and the Comedy Award I won. Not still proud. And uh, I got that first. I was like, what do I want to do? What, I wanted to be a novelist or a freelance journalist. So I thought I'll become a teacher. Right. So I've got my holidays. Yeah. Plus, I was always had this primary school thing I'm passionate about. So I thought I'll become a primary school teacher. Not enough men in primary school teaching. So I signed up to a PGCE, but I was headhunted within a month of leaving college to for an ad agency, because how many unis can you go to to look for graduates who are both good at English and vocationally good at English? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not many. So this would be as a copywriter. You were yeah. headhunted as a creator. I was. I was. What t- was that like? What, what was the tap on the shoulder like? As it, were. it was crazy. I was doing credit checking in the holidays just while I was waiting for my PGCE to start. Yeah. I got a phone call from my tutor that was the novelist, Sue G, wonderful writer. And uh, she phoned me and was like, are you sitting down? There's an ad agency. It's, it's pennies, 100 quid a week. It's an eight-week placement. But what an experience. And there's a, they don't really have a job, but they might make one if you're right sort of thing. And I was like, well, we know how this is going to finish. Because <laughs> I'm fucking like... It's like, like I've been in since that cigarette. Like I've been injected with something. It was quite that energy, which I thought at my age now would have stopped, but it's mm. and it and it did. Like if we in. have a meeting with Joe after this, yeah, and it was we could do this thing. I'd be like, yeah, yeah, and then the series would work like this, and then I'd be annoying as fuck until it. You wouldn't happened. be annoying at all. It's infectious. <laughs> no, it's genuinely. You're enthusi- you spend a lot of time apologising for who you are, and, and uh, you don't need to, do you? Really? Why, why do you still have that? It's probably your dad still, isn't it? It's, it's probably partly the com- comedians always there is that need double checking the all trying yeah. to be one step ahead of the heckle. Yeah, maybe it's that. So were you know. any good at advertising? So I started on a hundred pounds a week. 18 months later, I was head copywriter in the agency. 18 months after graduating, I was... I want to tell you something, very briefly, that that we've learned an awful lot about you and you've listed an astonishing catalogue of of achievements. You haven't once seemed even slightly boastful. I don't know how you've quite pulled that off, to be honest with you. But given the opportunity, I will, like, I can't believe... It's because I sort of can't believe I've done it. Right. I'm a bit like... A lottery winner isn't like, yes, I'm rich. A lottery winner's like, I'm rich! (laughs) I'm like that. Oh, my God, I've got a first. Oh, my God, I've done it. I'm head of copy. Because no-one's ever... I'm not getting the violin out. No. But no one ever told me you're gonna, you're amazing, you're gonna solve the world. In fact, I was told quite the opposite. Yeah, of so it's always, you are. A, it's always a pleasant. Surprise. So you're, you're, you're winning at advertising. I became head of copy. I won't be obscene and talk about 
uh, money. But Why not? It was cr- it was crazy. And I've come from. And your mum was still working as a cleaner at this point. My mum was yeah. She's done dinner lady, cleaning, and childminder. So, so, so I can't remember exactly what my mum was doing at this point, but probably she, I think she was cleaning. And uh, I was in an ad agency, so it's all good. My dad, my dad was like, I "Can't believe it, boy! Fuck you, you know, serious moolah." This is about <laughs> it's uh, two thousand, two thousand and one. Yeah, and I that was it. I did what my generation don't do: bought a house, yeah. bought a flat. I, I'd made it as far as I was concerned. But in I, such a short amount of time, Russell, from that cigarette to to the mortgage. Yeah, so the cigarette would have been ninety six. And yeah, I was buying I was a flat by, two, six years. by 2000, 2001. I was buying a flat in Clapham. Uh, so I, I, had pedig- I had pedigree cats, hummus in the fridge. I was sat hummus. on sat on coloured couches in the day. Going, what about if we run from this side? I'd been like in Star Trek style. Beam the middle classes have gone. Okay, then <laughs> beamed up. I mean, I still sound like a mor- moron. Thank God, because it's a funny accent. But I was, I was. <laughs> consumption. There's a lot of people. Who- put a lot of effort who went to public school and trying to sound like you do now though isn't there there's a lot of people almost culturally or socially moving we meet in the middle in the estuary in the opposite direction so uh, I was there were you happy were you satisfied or were you just pinching yourself every day or what pinching myself I think personally the tw- your 20s for most of us aren't the best decade of your life mm. you still got a lot of that <laughs> self harmy weird goth shit going yeah. on either literally or, or figuratively and that's why I personally think the best decade of your life probably is 30 to 40, where you still look young, but yeah. you can laugh. So I was still partying a bit too hard. Sure. It was still all that... Well, it goes with the territory, doesn't it, in the advertising yeah, industry? Yeah, and, 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 you know, obviously I got... It wasn't like my parents messed me up. I, I would say I was still a quite a complex person at, sure. at that stage. Didn't find it hard to make relationships successful, yourself. but I was happy. You, you did. You liked yourself. You liked who you were. I liked my work. Right. I don't, I've never had explicit feelings of disliking myself. No, of course. But there were now and again behaviours which weren't right. Got you. So, for example, nothing menacing, but, like, if I lost... A, I don't know, if something silly, like I couldn't find my house keys, it wouldn't just finish in a slammed door. Yeah. I'd have to take it to the next level. I yeah. might put a hole through a wall. Or yeah. I might be in a bad mood for two hours because of a traffic jam. It's like something obviously wasn't quite right in the tuning yeah. with the regulation of emotion. Yes. But overall, I was... If you asked my friends, they'd be like, really? You were the happiest person out of the group. Right, yeah. like, okay. Because I love work so much, I was flying high. But there were behaviour patterns that were spinning out of control with with temper and, and plummeting, which I did fix eventually. How? I did a Hoffman residential course and really? changed my life. You, you, Talk you about see, that in a minute. You, you see your life as a almost... Or you see yourself almost as a, as a constant work in progress, something that can be constantly improved. Const- I think all people should. Well, like, so do I, mate, yeah. but it's, it's yeah. rare to meet someone who's so upfront and honest about you it. You should and do, yeah. That, that, came late, that came later on. I'm happy to talk about that. But at this we're, point... We're probably not going to have time. <laughs> the, the, at this point, I'm flying you, high. It's 2001. Yeah. And then... I would describe what happened next as it reminds me of an advert that was on when I was at school where they tried to scare you from trying heroin, where you saw the needle go into the arm and it went into the bloodstream and it was like, at first you'll be sick, but you'll soon come back for more. (laughs) That's what happened to me. Someone said to me at work, why don't you try stand-up? The way you write copy and come up with headlines, you make people cry laughing, you lead all the pitches, all of the girls, you've got nothing nothing about you, five foot ten, you've got all the girls, you should be a stand-up. And it's something that had completely passed me by. It wasn't on my cultural menu at a weekend. Like, should we go out for a curry or should we go? And then when I got older, it was clubbing, skin up over the pot. It it just wasn't there. I have never heard of the Edinburgh Festival. Went through the whole of uni as an inverted snob. Didn't even have a TV, just listening to Radio 4, reading Penguin Classics. Uh, Plus my uni, one of the few in the country that didn't have a stand-up club. So it had passed me by. Gosh. Now I'm in middle class London where yes. people are like, hey, we're going to the open mic night. I knew it was in the background, didn't know what it was. Just knew I was a funny bloke. Yeah. Didn't know I'd been practising it my whole life. God. And my friend, the creative planner in the agency was like, please just try stand up. I just know you'd be ace it. So I just thought, like you might do a bungee jump yeah. or you might strip off and go through a field once. Just something to tell the kids one day. I thought I'd try it. And that was my needle in the arm. Heroin moment. First because time. after that my life career-wise, temporarily, fell apart. My relationship fell apart, my career fell apart, because I became obsessed, like someone does with a drug. Overnight? Overnight. Tell me about that first time on stage. Well, it was was average. I got a few laughs, but the first laugh was the the heroin in the veins. I was like, what was that? I've never had 
that pure level of we like you mainlined into the fr frontal cortex wow. serotonin dopamine yeah, yeah. engaged <laughs> what the fuck was that i mean i'm not a public speaker sure i hate it i used to, i was eating boxes of emodium i'm mean, not a natural stand up in front of a group good in a small group biggest show if you're meeting a small group yes but in front of 100 people shaking literally throwing up again the drug analogy follows and I felt this hit, and I was like, my e the ego, the one, like you said, that's not very good at being boastful, came out and went, oh, fucking have some of that. Right. Next day, I had the Time Out magazine. Where can I, how can I do free stage time? Who's doing a gig? There's one in a pub. I'll do it, filming it, showing friends, showing friends at um, work what I'd done. Yeah. It's all I talked about. And, of course, the copywriting over like, that year cliff. starts to go down. I was doing things like finishing work at 11, um, at 6 in Fulham, Driving to Manchester, doing a 20 minute unpaid spot, driving back, and then going back to work the next There's day. A, that, the word that springs to mind here is, is, is manic. It's manic. Yeah. Because I, I, I just, it sounds so Billy Elliot and cheesy. Shut up. But I just knew I, I was home. I thought I was, in the copywriting, I was happy, but I knew I'd found wow. every single person has that thing that they are the fuck in a grade supposed to do you've clearly found yours if you don't mind me saying oh, okay. and i i i just knew i knew i wasn't the best out there and i might never be the best out there but i knew this is the seat i was supposed to sit in and once i found my material that was it perrier award and i was fucking i just had to leave work and i was off that's when my mum had a problem because you were turning your back on security yeah. longevity first person in the family to to make it i've got this you flat want to be what a stand up comedian because it was it, it was at the start of x factor where dick stand on a cross and think they're going to be successful just because they feel like they should be yeah. and I thought, am i falling for that destiny that my am i falling for that destiny logic i thought i've got to go for it because i've got enough good stuff on my advertising cv yeah it's only 5 years but, but i've got enough there i reckon for two, if I do this for two years and it goes wrong, I think I could go back felt and have like a career. A safety net. It felt I like think a I could go back. Position. So I saved who, enough. Who up. did you confide in at this point in your life? Who would you lean on? Who would you talk to, if anyone? I don't. I don't think there was. I don't think there was anyone. So this, really. is, this is doubly. This is jumping out of an aeroplane with a, maybe the guy. A couple of the guys at work that were encouraging me. Yeah, but it's amazing when you friends. leave a job how quickly these amazing bonds and friendships can just yeah. not through any fault or criticism. They just wither a bit, don't they? And but they cease. My girlfriend at the time was, of course as most women should rightly be, and most, sorry, women and men should yeah. rightly be, are threatened by this. Right. As far as all of a sudden this guy you've been have, getting your dinner from the supermarket with is standing and, be, and having all these strangers coming up to him going, oh, God, you're, how long have you been doing it? And girls going, can I have a sell? You know, it's, yeah. it's only yeah, certain of types of people can deal with that. Yeah. So we were split up. I did my first gig in the August and we were split up by the October. Really? Because that is not who she wanted. That's not who she started going out with. You <sighs> begin to change it. There wasn't enough time for her. Yeah. My dad died in that time just as I started stand up. So I was out going through a lot of stuff. And uh, I lasted two more years at the ad agency and I was like, I've got to try. And I, I still to this day cannot believe. I got up at 10 a.m. today. Yeah. Do you understand how profound that is? I got up at 10 a.m. I'm a grown ass man. Yeah. It's a weekday. I'm working, I got up at 10. If I wanted to, I could have phoned the other thing I was doing this morning, Jolly, and pulled out and got up at midday. Yeah. What the fuck? I've won. <laughs> I've won. Except it's not a prize you valued when you were more input, more input, more input. No, but by the time when I did stand up, I, I, for, the, for the first year, I honestly skipped downstairs and, yeah. I, and would do like visualizations where I'm like, oh, just keep focusing on how lucky you are. And I still do that before I go on stage. I sit there and I focus. I see myself sat in the office, and I, and I and I do I jump around. That's how I get myself energized. But you loved working I, in advertising. Oh yeah, I did. But I was thinking, uh, I love the work. But now I've got the work and personal adjoined. Yes. If you find your hobby, yes. yes. Like I'm doing my hobby for a living. Sure. And, and the freedom is the word that oh, keeps crazy. shining out of you. Actually, there's a freedom here. Yeah, that I just love possibly it. Possibly you didn't even know existed, and which your dad, I think, did know existed and knew it wasn't for the likes of him. Yeah, or he'd like to have got hold of it. Funnily enough, my dad. Funnily enough, my dad did uh, Butlins one season and yeah, was a red coat yeah, well, or something. There you go. So it was, it, it was there, but it's just, it was just that that from so night that so that takes you from 1996 to 2003. Right, complete, just crazy change. Incredible, all, absolutely. I had no idea. I'll be honest all with born. you. I mean, it's filmic. There, so you're writing a. Um, <laughs> are you doing a? I'm writing a book at the moment, uh, like a about sort of autobiography type. Yeah, book. you should. But it's all based, if I'm being totally honest oh. with you, and it's your will be on a sort of chip on the shoulder, yes. immature Marxist, resentful anger yeah. was un was the was the fire 
and on top was the. But you've done it again, mate. You've got, it's not immature. It's not resentful. It's... No, but it was a bit stu- It was well, stupid. Why is it stupid? It, no, stupid. Oh, okay, okay. It, it, so it, it unsophisticated. Was, it was. It was a sort of oh man, working man. It was all born of that. That's yes. all gone now. Right. Now I just realise it's there for the taking. And what annoys me is we don't get into the primary schools of young working class lads, white and black, yes, and course. open their eyes and show them. And, and give them an alternative to what's happening at yeah. home where they are often being told, don't be daft, don't be soft, don't be gay. That's not for the likes of us. You shouldn't be doing stuff like that. Man up, pull your socks up. How can the number one indicator tough. still be yeah. what your mum and dad do for a living? Yeah. What does that tell you? Yeah. How is that based on your individual yeah. random genetic... I've obviously got something genetic that's gone yeah. in my brain that's different, which made no difference. I was working in a shop. It made Just a pure accident unlocked... There's nothing wrong with working in a shop. My family no, do it. But no, what I'm no, saying I is, I, I wouldn't know. have done all this amazing no, shit. It's, what it's, a waste to have missed it all. It, it is. You're right, and, it, and it, 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 a waste that you wouldn't have even known was being wasted while it was yeah. wasting away. So, how quickly after leaving the ad agency did you, did uh, possibly your mum, realise that you'd done the right thing? Not just you, but where it actually made sense to people who care about you. That so, oh, well, I, I left... jumped out of an aeroplane, but my God, that's some parachute. <laughs> I left in March 2006 with enough savings for six months for the experiment pay my mortgage and everything and uh, everyone the ad agency like my creative director my managing director all thought I was insane even the one that encouraged you to try no not, not, cre- not the creatives to... loved right. it Got but the, ah, the bosses the, 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 the bosses, bean counters like yeah. the they couldn't, I mean I would have made creative director I was clearly going there mm. it's a 200 grand a year job when I was a kid and uh, they were like what are you doing I just knew I had to do it that was March right in July I got a part I got a job for Channel 5. They they started a channel called 5 US. It's still on now. It might be called 5 USA. And the programmes are slightly shorter on 5 USA than they are because they have more adverts. Yes. So they needed a comedian to appear in the adverts going, I'll tell you the thing about Las Vegas. So I got flown to Las Vegas, New York, <laughs> and Los Angeles, first class I've never experienced in my life. Sure. And that was my first job. I know, it really took a lot of willpower not to phone work and go, fuck it. <laughs> that was my first job. And then I went and did my first Edinburgh show that August, mm. nominated for a Perrier Award. Newcomer. I was like, bang, we're off. Very different material then to what you do now. Uh, not by then. Not but by, by two, so now you were doing the personal stuff. By not quite in 2006. It, I was being personal. I was yeah. being myself, but I hadn't quite fully unlocked the dad stuff. You, at one point, you had an on-stage persona. You had like m- makeup. And that was like two. That was a real wrong turn. Though. Yes. So that 2000. We missed the wrong turn, have we? Was no, that, that's was... 2011. Oh, okay. That's sorry. Okay, I've got my chronology wrong. So 2006 was when I first started. Yes. I just looked normal like I do now, and. Uh, People were like the energy. It was a bit Lee Evansy, but a bit sociological yeah. at the same time. So I got recognition. I got nominated four times for this bloody award, Perry Award. Second most proudest moment of my life. I win it yeah. in 2010. Can't believe it. And then it goes what turns all what I call like Romesh Rob Beckett, where everyone wants you on everything all yeah. all the time. I went into that phase. Um, so I made a couple of decisions uh, that where I, I did shows. Where they were sort of stylized as the, as the, I was like this gothy yeah. sort of impresario, and I encouraged it, um, but I wished I'd had someone having my back going, mate. You might want to stop doing that because it looks a bit like you've got a bit of telly and you're turning into a, a cunt. I can't think of a better word. That's right. uh, you know, don't put. No one was yeah. telling me that. I need a bit of guidance, man. I'm fucking just an idiot from a ghetto yeah. who suddenly has got the world going like that. Yeah. And I just, my instinct is to show off. It's all I've done my whole life. It's always worked before. So I got, I did an exclusive with one channel, which was another mistake. I should have played across yes. the way like Jack, what some of the other comedians brilliantly do. And uh, I guess I just went, I realised what I'd done quickly. I was like, shit, let's not do any more of that. And pulled back again, but I just had a little bit of a, a wobble for a year where I was the show off went into pretension, right? I would say. And the personal life also wobbled around this time. <sighs> I don't think it like it likes to wobble as much as I've made out in interviews and on stage, okay? Because that sort of can, get, lets me off the hook a bit. You see, if I say that, do you know what I mean? I think so. Uh, whereas really, I think I probably just became a bit of a dick who was loving the attention, and I was like, oh, I'm gonna dress a bit more like Noel Fielding. He's really cool, yeah. and I just, I just lost it basically. You lost sight of you, probably just only for a year. Sure. Uh, and then my my relationship did 
break up at the, at the same time. But I don't, if I'm being completely honest, it lets me off the hook to pretend it was related. It was just a relationship that had run its course. Yeah, okay. And then I, I, but the bad coincidence was it was the first time I'd ever been single in my life. I've always had a girlfriend. I've always, I'm like, I oh, love you after one date person <laughs> since I was 16. Yeah. So, of course, I have my first year of being single. And famous. And people like me should not be single. Yeah. So I did a, a year of that, and I thought I was going to have to have, like, steel pins put in my pelvis or something. It was bad, mate. I couldn't... I couldn't... I was working really hard, TV, and I could not have a night off. I couldn't just sit in my flat and watch a sci-fi and have a curry. You had to go out and... I had to... I, it immediately went to me, you could be with a girl now. Right. You could be... You could be having sex with a human female. That's never worn off. Sure. It was amazing when I was 15, the idea of it. It's still amazing now. It's, I'm married and I'm still like, I'm going to have sex with a woman. <laughs> but it's, never, it's just never worn off for me. For some, some of us, it doesn't. And, uh, so you were, led, you, you were led around by your dick for a year? It really? was bad, yeah. really. I mean, I'd be way too scared to behave like that now with everything that's going on. Sure. Um, but and it's so recent. But at the time, it, it was. It, I've never been addicted to anything, and I thought, am I? Is that actually compulsive? Becoming... So I thought the next date I go on, and the heart does the. Whew, I was wearing what I could describe as an emotional condom, so that I yeah, didn't feel yeah, anything. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the next date I go on, and I get an. Eh, I'm going to go on a second date, and that oh. was it. That was Lindsay. You fixed yourself. You fixed yourself. Well, no, I just let go. There was a couple of girls. I was like, I quite like her, but I made a promise to myself. I'm going to have a year of being single. Right. Uh, but when I was Lindsay, I was like, no, I've made a promise. Let's go on a second date. Third date, fourth date, bang, gone. But Lindsay was in the front row of one of your gigs. Yeah, she was in the front row of a Chester gig. Yeah, in... Mate, every chapter of this story is almost unbelievable. <laughs> <isn't it? laughs> 2012. Yeah. She was sat there with her mum and dad in the front row. I was, in, I was, it was a year of being single and... I just I pursued I just pursued her basically, and oh, but in fact she'd left the theatre. Really? I so you just clocked how much you fancied her at this point? I'd, I'd, I'd had a like I'm, I'm sort of fluffing the chronology a bit. I'd had a sort yeah. of mini relationship in between, right? Sort of one that went on slightly longer, yeah. And I just I just finished that, and uh, I was in the front row and I saw this girl. And as you as you do to the front row, you're horrible to them, even more if it's a girl you fancy. Men grow up so well. <laughs> Horrible, horrible. Really, I made rude. I was. She's like Lindsay's from Manchester, but she's quite well spoken and posh, yeah. like that. But hail. So, so yeah, <laughs> and she had this fake fur jacket on her leg, which I pretended was real fur to the audience. And I was laying down and pretending that she was so posh that when she waxed her minky, actual real fur came off. And her dad's there laughing, and her mum's laughing. And I ran off stage, and I was like, I bet I never see that girl again. I was only sort of recently out of this mini relationship. Sure. So a couple of week later, I just tweeted the word minky. Yeah. Just. I didn't hashtag the gig, nothing. I just and I got a reply to a tweet from a girl I didn't recognise saying, "I think this refers to my friend because she's been using that word laughing in our group." Was she in the front row of your Chester gig? And I was like, "Is she on Twitter?" Yes, she is. Follow, follow, follow. And then we didn't meet up until a good few months later because we were busy and everything. We went out on a date in the April May. Bada bing. And that was it. That's I, lovely. And I, I said to her, look, this is who I am. I'm not going to be one of the bastards. I am sleeping around, total asshole. That's what this is today. If you can't handle it, mm. throw a drink in my face and leave. She went, you know what? Let's just have a drink together. Nothing's going to happen. Let's see how it goes. And we went like that till the August. And in the end, I was like, I, lo I can't help it. I'm in, I'm in love. I love you. And then there's my wedding ring, which on the inside says, you had me at Minky. So there you go. I can't say Romance is not dead. It's lovely. I don't knew this was going to happen. We've, 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 we've got to shoot over the time. So <laughs> personal life in a wonderful place. Career where you want it to be? Yeah, like, like I said, I think I, I took... I was going like that, which maybe yeah. I wouldn't have been able to handle, and the idiot spiky hair yeah. lying, lied about my age as well, something else I did, uh, wearing the eyeliner. I think that pulled the nose yeah. down, which is a good thing. Yes. So now I'm... Change management, I'm with... Off, off the curb. Yeah. I mean, that's where you want to be, man. Yeah, of course. I'm not, I don't want to. So proper want, management, as in looking get, after you and having a word in your ear. It's the Manchester United. You know, I don't want them to get a big head because they might watch this. But you look on the walls: Michael McIntyre, Lee Evans, yeah. Jack D. They have got Jonathan Ross. They got Robin. And, and, they're, and they're looking at you 10, 20 years down the line. They're not just trying to cash as many chips in as they can off your back. And in, in the, like some managements and some agents do. So that, everything's good. That, we need to talk briefly about the reason why you're here. Danny, who's, he hates being. In, no, He's not going to let me. He, no, Danny hates existing. He just said to me, right. comb your hair, yeah. put a suit on, finish puberty. So I did. <laughs> best thing I ever did. That's, that's, that's brilliant. Though. Now I'm busy. I'm busier than I ever have been. Through just from going, yeah. grow up. 
get right. married, have a kid, sort your life. Why didn't someone get me in 2011 and just yeah, do that? Because I would have listened. Have, wouldn't, yeah, well, you know better than anyone about being in the right place at the right time <laughs> and the moments actually presenting yeah. themselves. So tell me about Evil Genius, a new podcast, which is... Yes. This is where the interview goes vaguely professional for yeah. the last five minutes. It's so been done, a real pleasure. I've done, I've done all of this telly and all this touring, and then what you do now and again is you take a year off and you go invisible and you do lots of things you've always wanted to do, yeah. like develop sitcom scripts, blah, blah, blah. So I've always had this idea I wanted to do with Radio 4, and I never got to share it with them. So I got one of the big Radio 4 producers uh, out for a drink, Sally Heaven. She does a good read and all that, those things. And I said, I want to do a programme where we take famous dead people from history. It could be Einstein. It could be Richard Pryor. Uh, Charlie Chaplin and my panel roughly know who we're going to talk about I have to do the research and then I keep throwing evil stuff about them to try and mess up their perception or if we have an episode that works in reverse we start with Margaret Thatcher and I keep throwing good stuff and at the end they don't get to say I think it's quite complicated you know Thatcher did something they have to vote evil or genius it's like a parlour pub game it's like a parlour pub game that I played with my mates I never could have imagined it would work how it has. First of all, Radio 4 came back and was like, how about we do it as a BBC podcast, which is a new thing they're doing, which sure. is better, really. Yes. And, Gives um, you room to breathe. It's just been amazing. It really puts people on the spot. The discussions have been really funny. And as we're talking now, we've gone straight up to the, into this, a top ten podcast yeah. here, which I've never achieved before. I've done a few podcasts. So, you know, we're sitting above Desert Island. This, I'm absolutely buzzing. So the Richard Pryor one's just gone out today while we're speaking right now. We've still got Einstein to come. And, uh, it's, and you're getting a kick out of this, aren't you, in a way that it's a different kick to what you get. It's not the drug but it's being coursing through your veins when you talk about this. It's I, a different I, level of pleasure. I suppose so, yes. Yeah, a mature, reflective pleasure. But at the same time, I'm still getting that cramming. I, I right, mean, yes. we did a double record. We finished, we just smashed the, the John Lennon record. And as the door was closing, Sally went, it's Einstein and Gandhi next week. <laughs> <laughs> I had to learn the whole of Einstein and the whole well, of Gandhi in a week. And then the dr- you yeah, know, yeah, the, the Mr. Show-off, of Council of State. And um, also t- pushing it as far as you can push it, almost tempting danger, tempting I'm, fate, tempting failure. I suppose so, yeah. Maybe, I don't know. But to get to try and get a panel to see the evil in Gandhi, that was an amazing yeah. programme to record. I mean, I didn't realise... I mean, Gandhi's not been on yet, but you'll be surprised some of the stuff that man did. I was, I was shocked. I mean, if you want to know, so he, he's one of the. He wouldn't be on your list of top ten racists. No, but he didn't Had particularly like black people. Had his moments, which I found shocking. Um, you can obviously catch Evil Genius from where all podcasts are downloaded, as indeed you can unfiltered. They keep telling me to remind people that they yep. should subscribe to this as well. Is this a vodcast as well? I, it's every it. sort of cast. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. Don't um, say cast, we're talking about Gandhi. I, I'm just about to say, <laughs> but that's because you're a comedian. I knew there was a joke there, but I didn't know what it was. He no, 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 believed go. in the cast. I was shocked. He it believed. would have been very hard for him not to believe in the car. Did believed. you get the letter to Hitler in as well? Yes, yeah, yeah. He, yeah. Believed, he believed in the car system, but not the consequences of it. That's right, yeah. So Which he, is worse in a way. He wanted to romanticise the peasant and yeah, everything. Without, without, the, without the religious reward at the end of it. He'd be so it, great. Please come on, Evil Genius. He'd be absolutely to, phenomenal. This has, been a, this has been a rare pleasure for me. I, I, this, this whole series has been a revelation. We, could, we could definitely do a DJ because we've got our pick of dead evil DJs. <laughs> I have no problem. <laughs> I don't think there's much control. There's not much of a conflict there, though, is there? It's, it's, no, it's true, evil, 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 true, evil. Yeah, yeah. struggle to find anything. But he is, he is, we're speaking about him euphemistically, he is the benchmark of someone that tried to pile, to have what I'm talking about, yeah. so much good on one side to mask all the ugly, yeah. but to the point where it's not complex. So I'm trying yeah. to find the ones where... Yeah, there's nuance. For Richard Pryor, for example. And finally... Sorry. No, it's... it's, it's it, 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 what, what, ten years from now, do you have any... Because it seems to me that you actually have had, up until this point in your life, r- r- almost almost excessive levels of planning and plotting, which mm. you've pulled off from the moment you stubbed out that cigarette in your it's girlfriend's true. hall of residence. True. Is that still there? Have you still got... Yes. It is. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I've... There's the, I would say I'm top of... I'm, I'm playing in the... I hate football, Coca-Cola championship yeah. type thing. I, would, I don't care if I don't, Yeah. but I would love a, a stab at the next level. Stadiums. We're doing... Type, type thing. I think I would like to do one before I pop my clogs. Yeah. Maybe just a London one. I wouldn't do it anywhere else in the country because I don't... I'm not that comfortable in them as a gig. Right. But I've heard the acoustics at Wembley aren't bad. And I mean, I'm in that 1,000 to 3,000 seater range. So yes. My goal for the next 10, 10 years is to do another free tours, ju- just selling the same tickets. Yes. I would high-five the shit out of myself yeah. in a decade time. Something else I really want to do before the nursing home, a sitcom. Right. 
I would love to do a sitcom and I'd love to be S in a movie. Well, sitcom, do you, do you have an idea what yeah, about? Yeah, I'm developing a script right now. Does it have anything to do with your own childhood yes. your background? It's based around my old man, yeah. And if I, if I can be a Mrs. Brown's Boys and play my old man, it would be the ultimate Freudian closure. Well, there we are. <laughs> mate, that was an absolute joy. Seriously. Russell Kane, thank you so much. Cheers, mate. Hello, I'm James O'Brien, and I hope you enjoyed that episode of Unfiltered. There's plenty more where that came from, and plenty more to come, so do make sure you subscribe, either here or on iTunes or on any other platform where you get hold of your podcasts. Thank you.